Thank you, members. I call the honourable member Kevin Haig. Ki te whai au, ki te au marama, ka whai rei a hau. Tihei Māori ora. Ko te mea tuatahi, me mea hau ki te runga rawa. Nga ana nei, nga mea katoa. Tēnā koe. Papatua nuku te whai a e takutu nei, ranga nui e tū nei, tēnā kōrua. Ka mihi mō ngā mate, ka tangihi a tātou e tēnei wā. Nō reira, e ngā mate, Haere, haere, haere ki Hawaiki nui, ki Hawaiki roa, ki Hawaiki pāma māo. Āpati hono tātai hono, te hunga mate ki te hunga mate. Ki te hunga ora tēnā koutou. Ngā mihi mō ngā mana whenua o tēnei rohi, te ati awa, me ngā ati toa ranga tērā hoki tēnā koutou. Ngā mihi ki ngā tangata whenua o Aotearoa. Mai te ika a Maui, tai noa ki te wai paunamu, me ngā iwi katoa, tēnā koutou. E nai nei ka huri a hau ki te kōrero e pāna e te kaupapa o tēnā wā. Mr Speaker, I open in Māori because I believe my first words in this house should be in the first language of this country. Earlier this week, I took up my place in the House, declaring allegiance to Her Majesty the Queen. But I take this opportunity to also declare my intent to honour the commitment made by her antecedent, the Treaty of Waitangi. I come to this House hoping to make a significant personal contribution to those issues which are important to me, most especially the future of the planet upon which we live and depend, and the type of society that our children and our grandchildren will inherit. It is perhaps fanciful to think of my own personal contribution, but more appropriate to instead acknowledge that my role is as one of many, those who have come before and will come after me, and those many working today in the very many aspects of the national and international green movement. I salute you all. Being elected as a List MP perhaps brings a particular awareness that my being here is not a result of my work, but that of very many others. And I want to particularly acknowledge some of them. First of all, my family. My father, Chas Haig, my brother, my sister-in-law, Stuart and Bromwyn Haig, in the gallery today, my partner Ian and my son Thomas, who are not here today, I owe you all a great debt. I express my love and I promise to do my best to repay that debt. Those others in the gallery, Green Party staff, members and supporters, my fellow Green Party MPs, and those who may be listening or watching in New Zealand and around the world, my wider family, my friends, those who worked so hard to maximise the Green Party vote at this election, particularly in West Coast Tasman, and indeed members of the worldwide movement of Green Parties. I want to explicitly acknowledge that I have friends from other parties in this parliament and in previous parties, previous parliaments. We all come to this house with differing personal philosophies, but I hope a shared commitment to those whom we serve and to future generations. I give you an undertaking that I will listen to what you have to say, and I hope that you will offer to reciprocate that commitment. I'm conscious that I come to this parliament bringing with me the hopes and expectations of many, and I want to itemise some of those. Cyclists who want to see roads safe and well-engineered for all road users, or who see the fantastic potential of a national network of off-road cycling tracks. And I acknowledge today the Kennett brothers who have launched today their latest edition of classic New Zealand mountain bike rides. Those who love wild rivers, 
who hope for a new economics that values intrinsic natural characteristics and recreational use instead of just easily measured short-term financial gain. Gay men, lesbian women and the wider rainbow family who demand truly equal rights and equal opportunity. Those who work in public health, who know that the health of a population is largely a reflection of the power it has over its own circumstances and the environment surrounding it. And that good health improvement can only result from political will. Let us provide that. And also those people who understand that the same formula of empowering communities and creating supportive environments is also the answer for problems in education, in social welfare, in criminal offending and in many other areas. Indeed, these are not separate problems, but are all in large part manifestations of a common cause, marginalisation. Let's fix that too. Also, those many New Zealanders who believe that our collective future depends on a relationship between Māori and non-Māori that honours Te Treaty o Waitangi. And finally, all those many who hope for a better future for our kids and for our planet. Now, that's what I call a politics of aspiration. I guess my potential to disappoint is great. But I don't experience those expectations as a crushing or oppressive weight, but rather as a surging wave that lifts me up and sustains me. The challenges we face are very great indeed. Our biggest obstacle, as new scientists recently reported, in a grim addition that shades the international credit crisis into insignificance, is a world economy geared to the sole aim of economic growth. Growth is not inherently bad, but the indiscriminate approach to growth that sees any type of growth as good is our problem. Growth based on the increased use of non-renewable resources is by definition unsustainable and occurs at massive and irreversible cost to future generations. Growth achieved through the bubble economics of speculation is exploitation of another sort, where the non-renewable resource is human dignity and human happiness. We must change this to an economy of sustainability as a matter of urgency. We know this, but we have not done so because of investment in the status quo. Both direct financial, literal investment or emotional investment, fear of the changes that will be necessary to achieve sustainable living. One of the strengths brought to this House by the Green Party is our charter, based on four solid principles. Ecological wisdom, social responsibility, appropriate decision-making, and non-violence. I absolutely reject the idea that ethical or moral behaviour has its only source in religious faith. On the contrary, my personal philosophy presupposes that there is no higher power that has, for some reason, disadvantaged some people and conversely privileged others, or that will intervene to rectify this disparity or compensate its victims. In the absence of such external power, then the responsibility for determining how we should live together and the responsibility for acting to achieve that state is solely but collectively ours. Only two coherent philosophies are possible. Survival of the fittest, with no regard to the effect on any other person, or a world in which we recognise our interdependence and respect for the equal and inalienable rights of every person. I have a passionate adherence to the second of these belief systems. Effectively, this personal belief of mine is the equivalent of the social responsibility principle in our charter. It has echoes in to each according to their need and from each, to the, from, each, from each according to their means, or in my personal motivator, 
If not me, then who? If not now, then when? This is for me at the heart of my feelings of self-worth, that I have acted in an ethical and honourable way. What are these inalienable rights that each person is entitled to? Eleanor Roosevelt, who was the driving force behind the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, talked about equal justice, equal dignity, and equal opportunity without discrimination. I think another valuable right to conceptualise is autonomy, provided that the exercise of that autonomy does not reduce that of another person. For me, the opportunity to make decisions affecting one's own life, tempered only by the effect of those decisions on others, is driven directly from this idea and is exactly the idea captured by our principles of appropriate decision-making and non-violence. However, it is the principle of ecological wisdom which is my greatest motivation for standing here today. In the same way that first principle thinking leads me to a bedrock belief in universal human rights, this thinking also leads me to consider the rest of the natural world, not only from the perspective of resources that are necessary for the sustenance of human life, but also from the perspective of the rights or intrinsic value of entities in their natural state. My personal principle is to take only what resources I need from the natural world and to harm the natural world to the least extent possible. This is the thinking behind my being vegetarian for nearly 30 years. But regardless of whether our attitude to the natural world is driven by philosophy as miners or by the more pragmatic considerations of what is required for human beings to survive, the logical consequence is ecological wisdom. My sense of urgency comes from the growing unease and certainty that I have that the human race is reaching or has reached some fundamental limits to our ability to take from the natural world. But we are not yet responding appropriately. Human beings are not well adapted to deal with gradually unfolding risk or dangers that are rare but catastrophic. And our inaction now imperils the human rights of those generations yet to come. In the words of Lester Brown, we are crossing natural thresholds that we cannot see and violating deadlines that we do not recognise. Nature is the timekeeper, but we cannot see the clock. We are in a race between tipping points in the Earth's natural systems and those in the world's political systems. Which will tip first? In the past, we've been saved from the consequence of inadequate responses by technological advance. And while technological technology may now help us, it is currently ill-directed and it will not be enough. At a time when across the world a small flame of hope has been kindled for the future of the human race and for the planet by the election of Barack Obama, I'm reminded of events that are 40 years old. One of my childhood memories is of 1968 in my grandparents' house a hush upon us all, tears streaming down my mother's face as we heard of the death of Bobby Kennedy. As a new Green Party MP, I'm particularly conscious that I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. When I greeted those who passed on in my introductory remarks, I thought, of course, of Rod Donald. But I also thought of my mother and my sister, both of whom also died too young and did not live to see this day. I dedicate my time in Parliament to them. I know that some of you will look at the size of the problems we face and see them as insurmountable, but nothing that any one person can do will make any difference. Margaret Mead pointed out that, in fact, it is only the actions of individuals that make any difference. My own experience has incorporated many issues where the odds seemed hopeless, but the steadfast application of individuals made all the difference. And the most notable of these was the anti-apartheid movement, where the apparently impregnable fortress of apartheid was brought down by the actions of individuals. In June 1966, Bobby Kennedy spoke in Cape Town to the National Union of South African Students Day of Affirmation and said this, 
Each time a man stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centres of energy and daring, those ripples build a current that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Let us now cast our pebbles into the pond. Noreira tenakoto, tenakoto, hurinoa tenatato katoa. Members, the House is suspended.